Have you ever noticed that Latin America is, from a political social point of view, one of the most homogeneous regions in the world? In Latin America, most of the countries have the same language, the majority religion is Catholicism, and almost all of them have a common history, if only because most of them emerged after gaining independence from the Spanish Empire. And in the case of Brazil, with certain shades of difference, naturally, the path is, in many ways, very similar. Let's look at politics. Latin America shares a culture of presidential government, with leadership ranging from the right to the left, but often with a common ingredient, populism. So, in short, in social-political terms, we could say that the countries that make up this region are, at worst, first cousins. However, all these similarities and all these ties have a very clear limit, the economy. Surprisingly, in the economic field, the region is very poorly integrated and the variety of policies is vast. From Peru's unwavering prudence in controlling public accounts, to Cuba's communism, to El Salvador's blockchain populism, or the Argentine government's central bank's addiction to printing money. However, in spite of everything, did you know that for decades there have been numerous proposals for Latin America to have a common currency? Will we see the birth of the Latin Euro? Well, let's find out. And by the way, if you like economic topics, don't miss our sister channel, Visual Economic. On it, we talk about interesting topics such as the minimum wage, how the sanctions against Russia are working, and what problems the dollarization of a country can have. If you haven't discovered it yet, check it out and tell us what you think. That being said, now let's get cracking. Visual politic community, I don't think I have to convince you of this idea. Currency is an essential, key, fundamental element in every economy. Of course, not all countries have their own currency. In the world, there are some currency areas that include more than one country. Membership in any of these currency areas means that for the member countries, cede part of their sovereignty and adopt a common currency, either for day-to-day -day business or, in the more limited case, for trade relations among the member countries. <music> This is something that can fundamentally occur in two different ways. First, there is the case of formal and agreed unions, as is the case, for example, with the European Union and the Euro. On the other hand, there is the case of informal unions, which consist of unilaterally adopting a foreign currency. In other words, in this case, monetary sovereignty is ceded to a third country whose central bank is perceived as more reliable. This is, for example, the case of dollarized countries such as Ecuador or Panama. Be that as it may, we are not talking about processes that can be developed overnight, especially if we are talking about formal unions. In this case, for things to work, a series of conditions must be met. These conditions are more or less what we can all imagine. A low inflation rate, a controlled budget deficit, tight controls on debt levels, and a similar interest rate policy. Now then, we're not going to get too theoretical on this subject. It is enough for us to know what the monetary areas are in general terms. And now we know that, the question is, how did the Latin American experiments to advance along this path go? Let's take a look. Central America, a pioneering project, but stalled. On the 25th of February 1964, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras and Nicaragua signed the Agreement for the Establishment of the Central American Monetary Union. With this agreement, these countries urged their respective central banks to integrate into a Central American central banking system, which would be led by the Central American Monetary Council. The cooperation mechanisms established by the central banks point out the need and the opportunity to adopt measures tending to achieve the monetary integration of Central America in stages. Fourth point of the agreement for the establishment of the Central American Monetary Union in 1964. However, despite being a pioneering initiative in the region, the Central American Civil Wars completely curtailed this project. In fact, they plunged these countries into a very long process of political violence, as for instance, the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua, among others. Nevertheless, a new regional monetary agreement was reached in 1974, a first step that was again modified in the 1990s to relaunch a common monetary council. This was a body headed by the presidents of the Central Bank of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Its main objective was to advise the various governments on how to move forward with the reforms needed to establish the long-awaited common currency. The Council shall promote close coordination and harmonization of monetary policies with the fiscal, integration and economic development policies of Central American countries. Article 39 of the 1999 Central American Monetary Agreement. Later, in 2002, the Dominican Republic joined this agreement, but the currency was never heard of again. And in fact, El Salvador, for example, dollarized its economy in 2000. Today, this body, based in San Jose, Costa Rica, is basically a forum for dialogue. But hey, we have to keep in mind that this was a project that emerged in the 1960s, and it was truly pioneering initiative. At least we'll give it that credit. The socialism of the 21st century against the dictatorship of the dollar. 
According to Federal Reserve estimates, between 1999 and 2019, the dollar accounted for 96% of trade turnover in the Americas, an area where neither the ruble, nor the yen, nor the euro, nor any other currency has been able to displace Uncle Sam's paper money. Of course, this is not necessarily a bad thing. However, for the architects of 21st century socialism, this was nothing less than the dictatorship of the dollar. Something that, of course, was absolutely unacceptable for the icon of this movement, Hugo Chavez, who launched a crusade against the greenback. Although, on a personal level, he would turn out to love the greenbacks quite a lot. El imperio del dólar. Mira, el mundo es víctima del imperio del dólar entre tantos. Un día me dijo Fidel Castro Chávez, mira, Estados Unidos ha comprado medio mundo con puros papeles. Papeles que no tienen sustentación económica. ¿Eh? Pues llegó la hora. Nosotros tenemos la idea, y por primera vez la voy a comentar en público, de una moneda internacional que a mí me, me emociona la sola idea. El Petro. In order to put an end to the supposed monetary dictatorship, Chavism had in mind various ways to avoid the use of the dollar in its commercial transactions. And finally, in 2009, it was decided to implement a regional unitary compensation system, generally named by its acronym SUCRE, in reference to Latin America's independence hero, Antonio José SUCRE. Venezuela and Bolivia debut the Sucre. Both countries will debut the new payment clearing system created last weekend by the Alba countries. As its name suggests, this mechanism was not a currency in itself, but rather a payment system, where an exchange rate of $1.25 for each Sucre was established, which decoupled the use of US currency and imports and exports of the countries participating in this scheme. In other words, it operated mostly in a symbolic manner, but technically they were no longer operating in dollars. And so, in the common unit of account of the central bank of each country, the entry of dollars was not recorded, but rather the amount in sucres, even though these sucres were equivalent to a certain amount of dollars, which is what gave them their value. I know, this is kind of gibberish, it's a bit absurd, but what can I say, Latin America is kind of like that. Initially, this system was implemented by the Bolivian Alliance, or the members of the ALBA, an organization in which Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, Ecuador and Nicaragua participate. You know, the creme de la creme. El sucre es un sistema único de compensación regional, y eso Comenzará siendo una moneda virtual. Since 2010, the Chavista propaganda apparatus has been spreading the idea of the Sucre to the four winds. It was portrayed as an ideal mechanism, which could give rise to a new currency with the projection of replacing the dollar in a relatively short period of time. September 2011, Chavez calls for the creation of a Latin American currency in the face of the dictatorship of the dollar. However, the mechanism never managed to develop as a currency and remained stagnant as an alternative system to theoretically circumvent the use of the dollar, despite the fact that Hugo Chavez insisted again and again and again to the point of exhaustion on this issue. El sucre, algún día el sucre, yo me imagino que el sucre será físico, Rafael. Moneda física, ¿por qué no? Hasta ahora es virtual. Pero yo quiero, eh, oye, que mi palabra ojalá pueda incentivar a que juguemos duro con el sucre, no seamos mezquinos. Es un mecanismo maravilloso, ustedes lo conocen. Nos estamos liberando de qué de la dictadura del dólar a nivel internacional. Incidentally, it was the Ecuadorian president Rafael Correa, who we have just seen alongside Chavez, who led one of the countries that made most use of the sucre. Between 2011 and 2016, Ecuador executed at least 6,319 transactions through this scheme, which totaled almost 3 billion US dollars. And it seems like the politicians in this country know how to use it in a more beneficial way. Check this out. What was originally intended as a multilateral payment compensation system, in reality, operated as a mechanism for mostly fictitious and overvalued exports from Ecuador to Venezuela, which additionally served to channel operations related to money laundering, illicit enrichment and embezzlement. Fragment of the report of the Permanent Specialized Commission on Political Oversight and Control, report number CEP FCP 2021-2023-002. Well, what do you think of that? I'm sure you weren't expecting that one. The fact is that for this reason, since 2015, both the Ecuadorian justice system and various investigations of the Ecuadorian legislative have identified several money laundering schemes run through the use of sucre, which, by the way, ultimately ended up like almost all the promises of the almighty socialism of the 21st century, somewhere between drifting hopes and novel tools to expand corruption. Timidity and caution. The Latin American integrated market, Myla. Before continuing, we must digress 
briefly. Economic integration in South America basically has two faces. One is the Southern Common Market, known commonly as Mercosur. This is an organization made up of Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Paraguay, and Venezuela, although the latter has been suspended since 2019. The other is the Pacific Alliance, in which Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and Chile participate. Well, it is the latter that in 2011 formed the Latin American Integrated Market, known as MILA. This project is not a currency in itself, nor even is it a payment system. In the Pacific Alliance, things are being taken very slowly, and the first step towards true financial and economic integration was taken through this initiative, which does not unify currencies, but capital markets. This project currently brings together more than 700 companies from this economic bloc, which represents more than 40% of the GDP of Latin America and the Caribbean, and 38% of the total foreign direct investment flows in the region. It must be said that, for the time being, there is no concrete project of a monetary union, but the stability of the alliance members and their greater degree of openness and economic freedom suggest that they may decide to move in this direction in the not-too-distant future. But we're not done yet, so let's keep going. The most recent bets between Tango and Samba. In April 2019, an important meeting between the then Argentine Minister of Economy, Nicolas de Jovny, and his Brazilian counterpart, Paulo Guedes, was confirmed. This meeting was held in Washington amid an agenda of appointments with the IMF and the World Bank. At that meeting, both officials discussed the peso real, a common currency managed by Brasilia and Buenos Aires, into which the other Mercosur countries could eventually join. Having a common currency throughout Latin America would be very good. I believe in 15 years, there will be four or five major currencies in the world. In 15 years, there will be the dollar, the euro, the Chinese, Chinese renminbi, and hopefully there will be the real peso. I think we are going to end up with a common currency in the future, Paulo Guedes, in July 2019. However, months after this bold statement, Argentine President Mauricio Macri was defeated in the presidential elections and a new government took power in Argentina. Then the project was completely frozen, among other reasons because Alberto Fernandez and Jair Bolsonaro did not get along particularly well. Bolsonaro and Fernandez exchange insults despite Brazil and Argentina's interdependence. But wait a minute, because just as some elections wiped the issue from the agenda in Argentina, other elections brought the idea of a single currency back, this time in Brazil. Check this out. The Sir, a currency as a campaign promise. Banker Gabriel Gallipolo and former Labour Party presidential candidate Fernando Haddad, who by the way was defeated by Bolsonaro in 2018, made public the idea of creating the SUR, a regional currency that would be issued by a South American central bank. This bank would be constituted through the contribution of foreign exchange by its member countries in proportion to their respective shares in regional trade. The capitalization would be done with the country's international reserves and or with a tax on exports from countries outside the region. The new currency could be used for both trade and financial flows between countries in the region. Fernando Haddad and Gabriel Gallipolo in May of this year. Lula da Silva recently brought up this matter himself, incorporating it as part of his presidential campaign. God willing, we will create a currency in Latin America because we cannot remain dependent on the dollar. Luis Inacio Lula da Silva. In principle, the sur is somewhat more complex than the real peso, but the main difference is that now Argentina is no longer that dreamy country of 2019. <laughs> This year, the Argentine peso is one of the most devalued currencies in the world, with inflation expected to be close to 100% in 2022. And perhaps that is why in July of this year, the then Argentine Minister of Productive Development stated this. I spoke for more than an hour with Minister Guedes, and a central point of the conversation was the updating of transactions with local currencies. Daniel Scioli, 14th July 2022. The reserves of the Argentine Central Bank are completely decimated, so as long as they do not use dollars, the officials of the Casa Rosada are willing to throw themselves into the arms of any other alternative. Deputies debate the possibility of reaching a single currency with Brazil. The project that supports the creation of this currency was presented by the opposition, but has the approval of the ruling party. Of course, this does not seem to be the best context for designing a program as serious as monetary unification. So I am sorry, but as much as Argentina would like to move forward, it is not surprising that Brazil would like to put on the brakes for the time being. Building the house from the roof up. Visual politic community, Latin America is a very homogeneous region socially, but with low levels of consensus, constitutions that change every few years, and governments that often hang by a thread. And those things really complicate the idea of having a common currency, which as you have seen, has universal support to the left and to the right. Now, here is something to keep in mind. Countries stabilize their economies in order to achieve monetary unification. They do not unify their currencies in the hope of stabilizing their economies, which indeed seems to be what most regional leaders are hoping for. In other words, in Latin America, those who argue for a 
common currency seem to be supporting it in order to deal with structural problems such as chronic inflation. And that is the same as putting the cart before the horse. Having a common currency could facilitate a low inflation rate, positive growth rates, and reduce uncertainty. It could facilitate prosperity. But what it cannot do is guarantee it. And a common currency launched with so many imbalances could be born doomed to failure from the outset. If However, clear rules were set, a completely independent monetary authority was established, and monetary policy adhered to price control, then at least high inflation rates could be eradicated from the continent, and both savers and investors would gain a lot of legal certainty. But of course, without being able to get their hands on it, how many countries would remain loyal to this currency? But having reached this point, it's now over to all of you. Do you think we will really see a common currency in Latin America? Could governments like Argentina's overcome their addiction to central banking? Would politicians be willing to give up control of monetary policy altogether? Do you think Brazil will be able to lead such a project in the short term? Leave us your answers in the comments below and let's start a debate. Of course, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of us here at Visual Politic. And don't forget to check out our sister channel, Visual Economic. Once again, thanks very much for watching, all the best, and I'll see you next time.